Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 18 of Sports Betting Conversations. Today's episode is titled The Future of Sports Betting. We are joined by Lloyd Danzig, Managing Partner at Sharp Alpha Advisors. And as always, Kevin Twitchell, Advisor at Data Art. Thanks, Lloyd, for joining us today. Uh, please tell us a little about yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good, good to be here. Uh, I'm the managing partner at Sharp Alpha Advisors. We're a venture capital firm that specializes in sports, gaming, and entertainment. Uh, I went to Wharton undergrad, Columbia for grad school. Spent most of my career on Wall Street uh, as an investor. Uh, now have have taken my talents, uh, so to speak, to to focus on something a lot nearer and dearer to my heart, which is helping to bring forth the next big thing in sports betting and in adjacent sectors. Uh, I like to use the term competitive entertainment to describe the umbrella under which we invest and under which we expect uh, a lot of technologically enabled consolidation over the next five to 10 years. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And uh, you know, within your uh, portfolio or um, companies you're looking to to invest in, uh, like where do you see the most traction? Is it around sports betting or uh, uh, or operators or, or other companies within the sports betting industry? It is quite challenging in the U.S. Uh, to launch a B2C startup that is eventually going to compete with DraftKings and FanDuel directly for market share by offering a fixed odds, recreational focused sports book. It is incredibly capital intensive, incredibly regulatorily burdensome. DraftKings and FanDuel spend enormous amounts of money on customer acquisition and leverage economies of scale that are quite difficult to compete with uh, if you are a small startup. Uh, and so that is perhaps the one thing we specifically do not invest in, is, is companies directly trying to compete with DraftKings mm -hmm. and FanDuel for market share. Now, there are other areas of the B2C universe in the U.S., uh, that are quite interesting and that FanDuel, DraftKings, and the like do not necessarily focus on, at least not yet. Those include forms of skill-based gaming, online lottery, online casino, forms of gambling that maybe don't feel like gambling, or at least don't feel like it yet, but in an underlying capacity, they, they truly are. And then also on, on the B2C side, there are opportunities to unlock audiences that historically have been underserved by the fantasy and betting industries. And there are new geographies, just as the UK and Australia have been mature markets, whereas the US opened up more recently. There are markets that have not yet had their PASPA moment, whether they be Brazil, India, potentially Japan, where MGM just announced the first integrated resort that will contain a casino uh, in Osaka. So those are, I think, some of the opportunities on the B2C side. Uh, the B2B side is also quite interesting. Uh, as you guys and most listeners will undoubtedly know, the sports betting and iGaming industries heavily rely on B2B backend platforms that power a front-end front -end consumer focusing uh, website that really is more like a... Uh, a PR firm and a customer acquisition engine, uh, perhaps, than an actual sports book in terms of its underlying infrastructure. Uh, and a lot of the platforms and technology that currently power the US real money gaming industry were developed 10 or 15 years ago in Europe for a completely different audience that watches a different set of sports uh, and is not nearly as mobile, native, and instant gratification seeking as the young Gen Z audience in the U.S. is today. Uh, and so there are a lot of exciting B2B applications that are providing multi-billion dollar real money gaming operators with turnkey access to new functionality, innovation, and white label features. Yeah, yeah, excellent. And um, in terms of your uh, outreach, are you focusing on d domestic uh, companies or are you global? Fortunately, uh, although we do outreach, we get the majority of our high quality deal flow from inbound interest relationships, other VCs that we invest in, our LPs who are members and executives at most of the major sports betting, gaming, media companies around the world. Uh, for various regulatory reasons uh, and due to some of the sensitivities of our investors, we have a very strong preference 
for companies domiciled in the U.S., in particular those that are Delaware C Corps. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with where the majority of those companies' revenue generation uh, takes place. Uh, so we have more like probably a 65-35 split when it comes to U.S. revenues versus non-U.S. across the portfolio, despite the fact that the overwhelming majority are Delaware C Corp and, and U.S. domiciled entities. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, new operators is something that you're not particularly interested in, which which makes total sense because we're already seeing some consolidation and we're seeing points bet and try exiting some markets. Uh, even, you know, Fanatics hasn't even really gone gone live and they're already making claims like not going to New York. I think Massachusetts, they, they also might not enter. Maybe I, I'm wrong on that, but the, the markets where the tax rate is, is really high. Um, based on that, uh, you think, uh, what, what is your opinion about Fanatics making a, a dent, you know, into FanDuel, DraftKings, and, you know, Caesars embedded MGM, like, I guess, an extension of that? Yeah, mar market share has increasingly concentrated among the big four, which, as you described, are FanDuel, DraftKings, MGM, Caesars, generally in that order. In New York, where I am based, those four operators make up 96% of the market share. They make up at least 90% in most geographies where all four of them are active. Uh, even a company like Penn Gaming that has had the benefit of the momentum of the Barstool audience tends to not have even 5% market share in any of the states in which they operate. Uh, you point out PointsBet that has engaged Molis to sell its US business, perhaps even more notably, Fubo Gaming and MaximBet that have officially uh, shut right. their doors and, and potentially some other subscale operators that may meet a similar fate. There are only a handful, probably less than five groups of engineers, investors, entrepreneurs on earth that can successfully compete with DraftKings and FanDuel uh, and MGM and Caesars for market share. Fanatics is certainly one of them. They have the domain expertise. They have the capital and the war chest. Uh, the company's worth $32 billion and just raised $750 million almost exclusively to focus on their sports betting business. They have the benefit of an incredibly lucrative merchandise and collectibles business without the pressure of public investors that are breathing down their necks uh, regarding new projects. And so they can certainly weather the storm, operate sports betting as a, a loss leader or at least a loss maker for an unspecified period of time without feeling financial pressure and uh, worrying about the ability to continue making payroll. In addition, they have 80 or 90 million fan database. They have a presence at most major sporting venues through their operations of, of the gift shops or the merchandise stores at those locations. Uh, and so certainly you got to think if anyone has a chance, it has to be Fanatics or that Fanatics has to be on that short list of groups that have a, a real chance here. Uh, but that isn't necessarily a guarantee of success. As you had alluded to, Fanatics previously announced they were going to launch a few sports books in different states in Q1 of this year, and they were going to be live in every state uh, that offers sports betting by the start of NFL season. They have since more recently come out and, and backtracked on uh, those projections and those timelines, uh, not an enormous amount, but, but they have modified uh, their expectations and others' expectations. And uh, the rumor floating around in the rumor mill is that they're having a bit of trouble getting the product uh, to the state that they would like it to be. And perhaps the Amelco source code atop mm -hmm. which that is being built wasn't as amenable to the high quality product that they certainly want to put forth. Now, with all that said, the real excitement over a potential fanatic sports book, I think, is that perhaps they can offer a differentiated sports betting product, but much more likely they offer a unified experience where a sports fan can get all of their digital needs in one place. And one of the things that has, has now become public through circulated screenshots of the Fanatic Sportsbook beta is that every time you place a bet on the Fanatic Sportsbook, 1% of the value of that wager, 
and 5% of it, if you're doing a parlay, will be credited to your account in what they call fan cash. So you place a $100 parlay, you get $5 in fan cash, and that fan cash can be used to buy anything that Fanatic sells. Jerseys, merchandise, collectibles, potentially ticketing. And so perhaps people will start saying, if I'm going to place this bet anyway and get the same odds anyway, I might as well get a free Aaron Judge authentic jersey or whatever it is because Fanatics has these extra bells and whistles that that they provide. And in theory, there's a whole flywheel uh, experience that they can enable. And so I think that is the big question mark that everyone is looking to see resolved to answer the question of will Fanatics make a loud splash but ultimately die out as we've seen other subscale operators or will they have more staying power and use this flywheel, this one-stop shop experience uh, to do what very few others have been able to do in terms of carving out market share and wallet share in the B2C real money gaming space. You know, that's interesting. You're talking about the differential. Is that something we've been talking a lot about um, internally, about the importance of making these, <clears throat> the platforms, you know, the content and almost the the entertainment experience better and more sticky in your, in places you're investing and looking at what are the, and from your, your gaming background, where do you see it as far as technology and making these platforms more robust and more media platforms than just strictly sports betting? And also personalization as well. That yeah. Yeah. One that's game. actually where I, that's where I was going to start uh, on personalization. Uh, my view is that in the not too distant future, our entire lives will be dictated by recommendation engines. Your right. smart alarm clock will figure out the optimal time to wake you up. Your smart closet will recommend the optimal outfit based on what clothes are clean. Your smart fridge will present you exactly the right breakfast based on how much you ate yesterday and how much energy you need. And then hopefully your smart sports book or casino will serve you exactly the right player prop parlay or slot machine promotion or whatever it is without you having to navigate the app or spend any time discovering the right betting opportunity. I definitely think we're moving in that direction. And market leaders, incumbents, large companies in the space, they are particularly ill-equipped to innovate organically and in-house for the most part. And that is doubly or triply the case when it comes to implementing sophisticated AI solutions. Uh, and so most of, of the major companies in the space are looking toward third parties that have turnkey personalization solutions or leverage AI to enhance or enforce responsible gaming measures and, and things of that nature. Uh, and I definitely expect one of the major trends of the next three to five years in this space to be a decrease in decision fatigue and decision friction and number of steps or clicks or taps to place a bet and a dramatic increase in a more TikTok or Tinder style of user experience where you're just being fed almost an infinite, you know, short duration list of opportunities and you're swiping up or down or left or right, you know, fairly quickly and easily to pursue the opportunities and engage as you wish. Uh, to the other questions, we definitely are seeing on the heels of Penn Barstool, other brands looking to replicate or pursue similar types of relationships uh, better. Uh, the Jake Paul, Joey Levy right. uh, outfit, a lot of their value prop is based on what Joey refers to as low to no CAC, uh, referring to the minimization of customer acquisition costs that they feel they can attain by having their own owned media platforms. Uh, DraftKings bought VEASAN. They have investments in Meadowlark, uh, are, are exploring other opportunities uh, in the space as well. FanDuel recently repurposed TVG as FanDuel TV and is going to have, if they haven't launched already, a 24-7 network of, of FanDuel programming and sports programming that dovetails with their product offering. BetMGM did a deal with a company we're involved with called Almost Friday Media, uh, which is the parent company to Friday Beers and a, a bunch of other similar Barstool-esque uh, brands that they're partnering with. Uh, and there are all sorts of other interesting collaborations and partnerships that, that we're seeing because at the end of the day, this is an industry where the lifetime value of a customer is higher than in almost any other industry. And having and holding and engaging and retaining that user 
is the gold standard. It is the lifeblood of long-term profitability. And so questions as to leveraging AI for personalization or marrying a sports book with a media company to create a more integrated customer journey, all are in the service of driving that lifetime value and retaining customers without allowing for leakage to competitors and, and other areas of wallet allocation. And, um, you know, so, some of the, um, I guess, uh, personalization options that are not in the major operators today, uh, do you have a sense for whether they're kind of looking at these third-party apps that do certain things that they eventually, or they might have on their roadmap, or are they developing everything in-house themselves? Uh, a little bit of both. Uh, and a little bit of a, a third option, uh, which is often a common trajectory in the world of innovation, uh, which is that a third party approaches an operator. The operator says, we're going to build this ourselves. And then six months later, comes back to the third party and says, never mind, that was harder and more expensive than we anticipated. We'll take what you're selling. Uh, and or, so it was a mix of or, or they call data art. Or they call it <laughs> that's yeah, usually what that's, that's usually what happens is when they really want to innovate they they call us and and we can because uh, that's our whole business is is really customizing solutions you know that yeah. that the partners will own it's uh you know hanging around the hoop to, to get an easy layup when a company realizes they need your service uh is is certainly a way uh you know to do business that that can be quite useful to your question. Uh, there's a whole range of third-party products that operators are currently using, some of which are announced and disclosed very publicly, others which are quite private and confidential, others which occur on more of a trial basis. They range from third parties providing business intelligence dashboards that operators and traders can use as cues and indications of how to manually adjust various parameters on their end, all the way up to fully automated and integrated front end solutions that use a third party's AI model, but a op an operator's front end rendering engine to provide a user with slot machine A versus slot machine B or promotion number one versus promotion number two. And then somewhat in the middle of those are typically API solutions where an operator allows a third party to ingest their user level and bet level data, either on a continuous basis or at the end of each day, and then updates their models and allows the operator to call that third party's API so that you can implement code snippets that say something like, show user optimal slot machine here in a way that will automatically populate based on a constant real-time monitoring of user behavior. So different operators are all over the spectrum. There are certainly some that are planning or hoping uh, to build, you know, a, a full personalization and 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 user cohort segmentation engine in house, uh, and then of course there also are solutions for the most part provided by some of the larger CRM companies uh, that try to offer a personalization or audience segmentation toolkit alongside their CRM software. Yeah, interesting. So uh, kind of shifting topics a little bit. So you know, as as an investor. Um, you know, how are you approaching you know, the, the current climate in, in the economy? You know, since the beginning of the year has been, you know, I, I'm even, you know, to say the least, maybe a touch more positive than, than, you know, people were anticipating it to be, but still kind of the path ahead is, is unclear. Has that shifted your focus in terms of, you know, type of company, um, or, uh, an area of entertainment that you're investing in? I think that. We've had conviction in the secular tailwinds for growth of real money gaming and competitive entertainment prior to the run-up in valuations, as well as prior to the crash. And we, we remain convicted in that thesis. Certainly, we and most investors have made adjustments related to the size of expected exits and the velocity of potential follow-on financing. And so you have seen valuations at the early stage retract a bit, that deal velocity retract quite a bit more. Uh, I don't think anything has changed thematically uh, about our, our, our thesis. Uh, it's more 
a question of what will capital availability look like when this company needs to raise uh, a new round of financing. And if the expectations are lower than previously, there's an increased focus on profitability and unit economics at an earlier and earlier stage. Uh, so ultimately, I think everything in which the way the market has changed has really been uh, quite healthy uh, and, and has caused valuations to come down, but really normalize to a, a more sustainable level. It has caused diligence processes and time spent with investors and managers, management companies getting to know each other to extend in a way that is quite healthy. And companies are are building. They realize that investors are underwriting traction and execution, not hype and salesmanship, and they are building their companies accordingly. Uh, And I think it will be many, many years until we actually see this, uh, but that will percolate through all of the future stages of the startup journey, and I think result in a a much healthier, more sustainably profitable, scalable set of companies launched today or funded today uh, than two to three years ago when money was a lot cheaper uh, and founders were slightly differently oriented in terms of growth versus traction yeah makes sense um and uh kind of you know taking a look ahead like the next i know you covered a little bit of this in our conversation so far but like over the next you know three to five years maybe uh how do you see the uh, gaming industry um you know growing uh, evolving um changing spreading uh you know across not only you know, in, in the States, but, you know, across the world. I think it will be regulated in a lot more jurisdictions going forward. Uh, it will take time, certainly, to expand beyond the current set of iGaming states uh, in the U.S., but we will see more states operationalize online casino and sports betting, and we'll see more countries do so uh, around the world. I think the industry, uh, for better or worse, will tend to focus on the low volume, high margin, recreational entertainment seeking customer who views and classifies their deposits as entertainment expenses, not as capital investment from which to earn an ROI. Uh, And so we will see a lot more casual, consumer friendly, user friendly, gamified products offering instant gratification an equal chance of winning for all no ability for one person to have an edge over another necessarily, uh, and a minimization of decision fatigue, friction in the sign up and that discovery process. Everything will move, I think, more toward a an entertainment focused recreational uh, experience. And I think we will also see the industry absorb adjacent product verticals that previously were not thought of as even being adjacent to gambling, but will ultimately uh, find their stride uh, very much within uh, the the gambling purview alongside casino, lottery, and sports betting. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Well, it's been a good discussion. We could probably go on all day with uh, <laughs> talking about the future. Um, you know, we, we just probably wrapping it up. We always like to say, you know, like, you know, what is it short term in regards to technology? You know, are you most excited about? You think? I think particularly now that Chat GPT has been released, and everyone who's technical or non technical is aware of the fact that AI is a, a, a real technology that is useful and applicable uh, and and relevant to every business on earth. I think that really is going to supercharge some of the adoption that we will see, both for discriminative AI and for generative AI, the latter being the newer classification of AI tools that ChatGPT falls under. Uh, Others, particularly in the discriminative field, uh, have been utilized in sports betting for quite some time now, but in a way that perhaps many are, are, are not quite aware of. And I think this will bring awareness of AI use cases uh, to the forefront uh, and really, really expedite the the process of navigating which of these use cases AI will provide a, a true edge in and, and have a sustainable role in uh, and how that will impact operations going forward. Now, do you think uh, 
the introduction of AI into any of these you know, sports betting apps or, or even like, you know, the casino uh, apps, you know, where, where they're legal today, um, do you think uh, uh, there will be significant hurdles with, with the regulations? Because like, even now, you know, the federal government is talking about somehow, uh, you know, con- pulling the reins a little bit on you know, what's going on with, with AI. Uh, I can imagine be some pressure in this market as well. I think AI is used and it is a part of the online gaming experience more more than many people even necessarily know or, or realize. Uh, and I think it's going to be quite a while until gaming regulators have anything specific to say about AI. Uh, I, I think that if responsibly applied, artificial intelligence can be used to monitor users uh, and detect deviations from responsible gaming behavior in real time and direct those users back toward safer play. Uh, and so I think as long as, as technologists are, are relatively responsible with their applications and deployments, uh, I don't anticipate the type of regulatory burden that you're describing in terms of you know the federal government looking at large language models. I don't expect too much of a drag or friction on that uh, in the space, but I certainly expect more scrutiny uh, and, and oh, regulators to have a, a greater level of awareness of the technology and that is one of the things I think that ChatGPT will will always be known or remembered for. In addition to its uh, technical capabilities, it really put the AI discussion on the map and made it a mainstream discussion that people with no orientation towards software or data science whatsoever are now aware of and using in everyday conversations. I mean, yeah, that's a good point. That I think uh, you know AI has been part of our lives without us even noticing it. And, uh, you know, AI ML has been talked about as the next big thing, you know, at least in the, you know, in the media industry where Kevin and I work in for, for years, but there was no, not, nothing of substance or value, right. Or tangible that anybody could ever show like, oh, this is a great value prop, you know, based on AI. It was mostly, uh, at least from my purview, um, um, similar to just, you know, analytics, right. <laughs> Rather than. Yeah, you know, the generative um, AI, which is kind of the new version, and right, you know, all, all of a sudden, just you know, Chat GPT just became so popular so quickly. Now, it's been taken to the to the forefront. Um, so, yeah, that, that's an interesting observation. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. We we talked about a lot. I think there's a lot more to discuss. I think we're going to invite you back, Lloyd. Uh, so let's do it. I enjoyed the conversation. <laughs> Would love to come back. Hopefully, uh, hopefully get some nice feedback on this episode and, and we'll be glad to come back. I'm sure I'll see you guys at SBC, we'll be at SBC uh, next week yeah. and, uh, and all the other conferences too. Uh, and yeah. all the other conferences, uh, we could, we could follow up at any of them. Yeah. We look forward to, you know, your next venture that you invest in, you know, uh, absolutely. I'll okay, you, get, you guys will get the first look. Don't worry. All right. Perfect. <laughs> All right. See ya. Yeah, All right, see you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.